Why do we need oneness and manyness? I was born and raised in the north, just outside Chicago. I was baptized in the Methodist Church, one of the Protestant minorities within the heavily Catholic Chicago area. I was ordained in the United Methodist Church 43 years ago, and I'm still a member of that denomination. It is a denomination in the U.S. that's about half the size it was at my baptism. I am white with one parent whose parents immigrated from Italy and one whose ancestor derives from Germany and the Bohemian part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. I and my four siblings are the first generation in our families to attend college. My parents voted Republican. I think four of the five of us kids lean Democratic. Two of my siblings, both of my brothers, are on public assistance. The other three of us, by socioeconomic standards, are middle class, upper middle class, and upper class. My wife and I adopted a child from Guatemala nearly 16 years ago. Her DNA indicates her lineage is Mayan, Spanish, and a mix of others, including relatives from the distant past from Sub-Saharan Africa. I root for the White Sox, the Bulls, and the Bears. I've lived in rural, suburban, and urban areas in Illinois, Wisconsin, Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, and Oklahoma. And that is just me. A bit of my manyness as evident in geography, race, and ethnicity, religion, education, politics, socioeconomic status. I'm also a cisgendered, heterosexual, twice-married man. There is no doubt the United States of America is a manyness. We know that from the first. The settlements that eventuated into this nation included persons from Spain, England, France, the Netherlands, and the like. Protestants and Catholics, also Jews and Muslims, rich people and entrepreneurs and indentured servants. There were the hundreds of complex native cultures already here. Encounters, clashes, wars, and blendings between these cultures and the European ways created legions of diversities. Women and men were both here, of course, and each with very different status. And from the first, both Spanish and English colonists brought enslaved Africans, who themselves brought multiple identities with them. The colonies each had their own founding stories and cultures, and while the colonies united enough to throw off their overlords, they did not believe in and work for the same alternative. They confederated without giving up state sovereignty, and they federated building their distaste for a central authority into the Constitution. But they also allowed enough ambiguity and gaps wide enough to split the nation that could develop. Can rights differ between the states? Can black people be free in one place and enslaved in another? Can a black person who escaped slavery into a free state be legally pursued in that free state and the authorities employed in the face of that free state to aid in, in returning the enslaved person? America was and is a manyness. One could argue, and I would argue, America's oneness has been far less evident than our manyness. The American claim to freedom has always meant more freedom for some than for others, and is more about freedom from than freedom for. Philosophers name such freedom negative freedom. Said in the vernacular, you are not the boss of me. No one can tell me what to do. This understanding of freedom makes oneness impossible. Historian Colin Woodward argues America has had 11 founding cultures. One cannot tell our history as if the pilgrims laid down the cultural foundations. Not anything pilgrim or New England in New Orleans, Miami, San Francisco, Taos, or most of Oklahoma. And one can still discern the fabric and contours of each of those 11 cultures in different parts of the country. America has never been united by religion. The First Amendment said American Jesuit John Courtney Murray is an article of peace rather than faith. Since 1965, Americans can claim we come from every nation on earth. We are 50 states and several colonial era territories, all the states with their own constitutions and claims of rights. Our geography stretches from the Florida Keys to the Aleutian Islands from Imperial Beach in California to Escort Station in Maine, and then over to Hawaii, plus the U.S. territories. From at least as far back as independence, 
there has been a battle to define our national origin myth. Are we descended from a Christian nation held by God for Europe's overflow, plus their former servants and slaves? With an Athenian-style republic of limited number of free male white property deciders? Or a new kind of nation, many peoples from many places, learning to live and self-govern in shared spaces where equality and freedom must be in an inseverable, intense relationship? One can trace America's current battles over our soul to these and other founding myths. This class is about the relationship between oneness and manyness in the U.S. First, let's look at it, the components. One from many. Why do we need oneness? Why do we need manyness? For each of the two concepts, one and many, I'll take a look at some of the reasons each is desirable. And I'll also name what I consider to be counterfeit representations of oneness and manyness, or perhaps counterfeit ways to behave to achieve oneness and manifest manyness. So why do we need oneness? We need oneness because every group, from a couple of two to an eight billion person world, needs a practical modus vivendi, a way to handle conflict. There needs to be a way to address differences, both the trivial and the profound, and live in the same house or village or region or nation Without an agreed mode to manage conflict, manage and not resolve, the conflict can fragment or dissolve relationships. A functional modus vivendi is an essential element of oneness. We need oneness because while a nation does not need a center in quite the same way a planet needs a bigger body to hold it in orbit, in order to be able to say, we are all Americans here, there must be some kind of center to hold everyone in orbit. Wonky and colliding as the orbits may be, we need a deep myth of origins and destiny, a common story in which we see ourselves. There are millions of variations of the theme of what it means to be an American, but there must be some standard by which we judge what is legit and what is not. We need oneness because the great evolutionary strength of humanity is our ability to cooperate, to perform tasks for both being and thriving. Without cooperation, we will not sufficiently support a common fund in its mandatory form, that being taxes, and its voluntary form, charity. Every society has common tasks that really cannot be accomplished well by solo flyers developing moral codes and customs, raising children, producing goods and services, and connecting with markets, safety, and defense against external threats and internal threats, common threats, repair, producing and distributing clean water, air, soil, food. In short, we, the nation, we human beings, need oneness in order to live well, and probably to live at all. In terms of the value of life, a nation strong in cooperation, love, justice, and compassion offers a better life to its inhabitants than a society based on competition, hate, injustice, and cruelty. How do we le legitimately achieve oneness? There are counterfeit versions. Among the counterfeit instances of oneness for a nation are the following. Unity through authoritarianism. Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan argued human beings surrender freedom for order. The monarch guarantees law, order, and peace. He or she is the last word on everything, including religion. How much individual freedom are Americans willing to sacrifice for a guaranteed oneness? Apparently not an N95 mask's worth. Unity through hate. Hate requires a grievance, sustained fuel, and an enemy. If an enemy becomes a friend or otherwise ceases to be a salient enemy, unity through hate requires finding another enemy, and then another. Unity through religion. One can produce many examples from history that demonstrate religion when, when religion sits on the throne of power or 
either a religious institution or a state authority wields the swords of the spirit and the state, religion has done a pretty lousy job of combining freedom and unity. Unity through jingoism, that extreme form of selfishness which turns away from love of nation to my country is the best and all the rest of you stink. Not even America first, but America only. This lens blinds us to all the countervailing facts. For example, in such important matters as freedom and equality, the U.S. does not rank all that well in the world. And most of us realize that in a critical matter such as health care, while we spend more per capita than any other nation, our health outcomes are nowhere near number one. Unity through a social hierarchy allegedly rooted in natural law and using both law and culture to control as a means of defending the hierarchy. Patriarchy, white supremacy, heteronormativity, claiming public space exclusively for a particular form of Christianity over any other religion, some versions of the meritocracy and capitalism. Arguments are made for the natural superiority of each of these claims. But in all cases, Unity is founded on the sands of variable freedom and inequality. Let's move on to what manyness. Why do we need manyness? Well, a practical reality is that's what the nation is. That's the starting point. The nation was founded by different peoples in the hundreds, if we rightly include all the indigenous peoples. And we crisscross social boundaries all the time. When my parents got married, their Italian and German Bohemian heritage was considered a mixed marriage, as was my uh, any as was any Protestant Catholic nuptial. With the dozens of identity elements that are salient today, our manyness will multiply. Robert Putnam asked in his book *American Grace*, "Why has America never had a religious war?" Well, one could argue he wrote a little too soon. His answer. Intermarriage, our mixing in the U.S. has been a saving grace. We need manyness because each of us, as individuals or within our cohorts, is wrong about something. We are all fallible. Fallibility is a characteristic of all mortals. We need the many for the sake of correction and for seeing more of what is true. We need manyness because there are many paths to pursue happiness as, as a life goal. There are so many examples of, of this idea in history. Did you know that, for instance, when white people were taken by native peoples in various battles in the 18th and 19th centuries in this country, in many cases, when given the chance to return to European ways, the previously captive persons chose to stay with the native group? Why? because they believed they were living a fuller, better life in their adopted culture. Any one culture is a Procrustean bed for difference, innovation, and insights that lead to growth and change. Another practicality is this, in any society, there are many jobs to be done. In a tech-driven world and with various real dangers that threaten or threaten to threaten our lives, there are scores and scores of jobs to be done. I know I could not be a pilot, get dizzy, or an oil field worker, so many reasons, or a decent kindergarten teacher, among legions of others I could not be. Counterfeit manyness. What about counterfeit manyness? This side of the oneness manyness, uh, manyness uh, equation is a bit tougher, I think, for Americans. We fear whose politics and worldview shapes oneness more than we fear the chaos of manyness. It's important to recognize that manyness can be counterfeit and therefore a hindrance to legitimate oneness. One counterfeit is claiming individual freedom as an absolute. There's no such thing. The claims of freedom always demand context. As soon as other equal beings are in the picture, my freedom is necessarily limited by the freedom of others and vice versa. Someone claiming that freedom means doing exactly what I want is making the claim of an idios, said Aristotle, a being who cannot live with others in the polis. 
Counterfeit manyness can flow from the claim that there is only difference. I believe this is a reaction to oppression, to imposing the experience of one group on another, as in the only real or natural or godly way to live. Along with many differences between individuals and identity groups, there are also oodles of similarities. From basic emotions to DNA to developing cultures to promote and uh, some qualities and dampen others. Then there's the assertion that people can't change or that categories are impermeable. Groups are not a constantly moving kaleidoscope, true, but neither are their boundaries fixed. As much as ethnic, racial, religious, state, cultural purists wish they were. Dig in your own DNA and family histories, and then a nation's history, and you'll find more diversity and less purity than any purist can stand. Categories tend to be cleaner than life, and cultures do change. So, why do you think our society needs oneness and manyness? Or do we? And do you see counterfeit versions of either? Let's talk about these questions, your questions, the points I raised in the lecture, and the points you will want to make on Thursday, and if you have the time, in the chat on Mighty Networks.